Welcome to the 31st uh, session of the Wharton Entrepreneurs Workshop. I'm Doug Collin, the Vice Dean for Wharton San Francisco. As you can tell, we're, we're operating under some adverse circumstances here. Normally, we have our, our sessions in a classroom with lights and ventilation. So today, we're kind of winging it. Uh, delighted to see everybody here. I understand there's a bit of hand-to-hand -hand combat to get in here and then also to get up the service elevator. So we're, we're delighted to see that people are so persevering. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Usually, we announce the next workshop. Uh, we're going into our summer hiatus at this point, so our next workshop will not be until either September or October. Uh, these will continue, but it, it takes a fair amount of heat and light to organize them and to get things set up. So we're going to take some time off, and then we'll be back with the next one uh, in the fall. Um, I was going to make the comment that this event is being recorded. We're going to try to see how long the batteries last. <laughs> if, if we're successful, we'll upload it onto our website. If you Google Wharton San Francisco under campus programs, you'll find all these sessions that are recorded and uploaded so for future reference. Um, and the last point of housekeeping is simply that we bring this to a hard stop at 9 o'clock. We recognize that people need to get out of here and get to their offices. So. Um, no worries, we're not going to continue past the appointed hour. Can you hear me okay? I'm a little bit, usually we uh, we have amplification, but you're okay? All right. Um, so let me jump right into it. Our title, the title of the topic today is, is uh, Pricing of Products and Services, the Value of uh, the Art of Value Engineering. We hope there's a little bit of science in it as well, but it's mostly, uh, it's, it's a lot of experience and judgment that comes to bear on this. Let me quickly introduce our speakers. We've got two great people speaking on this subject today. First, John Sober, who is a partner at Blumberg Capital, which is an early stage uh, venture capital firm just up the street a few blocks. Um, it's remarkable, frankly, for the range and scope of companies that the, that the firm invests in, and maybe John can talk about that a little bit. John's a graduate of this, the Wharton MBA program here. He graduated a few years ago. Um, he was, um, before that, he got his undergraduate uh, engineering degree um, at Harvey Mudd, I'm trying to remember this, and, and then went on to get a master's in engineering at, uh, at Northwestern. Um, before joining Glover, he worked in executive positions with several startup companies and consulted for a number of large, iconic companies such as HSBC, Toyota, and Accenture. Um, John. I'm poking here, sits on 60, is on the, on the board of 16 companies that Bloomberg has invested in. Uh, this is what it means in the in, in this industry parlance to be overboarded. John is the personification of that. Uh, Stu Aaron is the chief commercial officer of Blue Jeans Network, which is a highly successful cloud based video conferencing service. And hopefully, Stu can, can spend a few minutes talking about that as well. He's got 20 years of experience in technology, marketing, product management, and business development. And that includes uh, VP positions at Bloom Energy, which is an established leader in the, in the clean tech space. They do uh, fuel cells. Um, also at uh, Top Spin Communications and at Cashflow, a long list of other successful companies that went on to achieve um, good exits. Uh, uh, Stu has an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Cornell. And um, we're delighted to have both of you guys here. Please join me in welcoming them. I was just going to say as an opener that it probably is no coincidence that my past experience of the, that Blue Energy has caused pg and &E to turn off the uh, <laughs> Probably has more to do with somebody not paying their bills or, or something like that. Um, so I was going to say, since we're a little bit informal today, um, I think both of us have a, a fairly wide range of, of background and experience, so could I ask you guys a little bit quickly so that we can maybe tailor this towards what you like. How many people are interested in enterprise type pricing discussion? Okay. And how many people? Actually, um, okay, so that, that helps. <laughs> So like Doug said, I am overboarded. I sit on, um, I, I usually estimate a little bit lower than what the total number is because it's just it's too high. Um, 
I sit on boards in, well, beyond just sitting on board, too, too many boards, I sit on boards in multiple different geographies. So I'm on five boards in Germany, I'm on one in Israel, I'm on one in Malta, and I'm on one in India. Um, in addition to some up here in the Bay, in the Bay Area. Uh, I don't travel to all of them all the time, but I do seem to be on planes quite a bit. Um, and then Blumberg Capital, as Doug said, invests across a large, uh, pretty broad area of technology. We're always investing in software. We do a lot in, in SaaS model and enterprise. I would say we're about 70% enterprise and about 30% consumer. Uh, my boards cross both, so I sit on a couple of e-commerce company boards as well as several SaaS model software uh, companies. Uh, my background just is, uh, I've been an entrepreneur a few times, had an IPO once in my career, um, had a failed company once in my career too, so I've seen a couple of you know, interesting ups and downs. Um, and so, I'll, I'll, let's do it. Great, and uh, I guess if I were to uh, give you a, a snapshot into, uh, into my background, I, I call myself a serial startup guy. I'm passionate about uh, those kinds of companies, I'm passionate about joining them in that early initial digital market phase. And I'm often the first non-engineer that's brought into the company to kind of figure out how to take that nugget of a value proposition and build a company out of it. One of the things you may have noticed in the, the brief background that uh, Doug gave, if you're familiar with uh, with any of those companies, is I kind of have made it a, a point and a conscious decision every couple of years when I've switched from one startup to the next, typically because it's gotten you know big enough, or it's it's IPO in one case, it's gotten acquired in another case, uh, <coughs> etc. I made it a point of kind of bouncing around to different industries. Uh, I've been in the you know the hardware business, the software business. SaaS business. I've been in the telecom industry, in the energy industry, and in the data center industry, and in the business consumer space. And uh, you know, one of the things that's followed me through all those experiences is a serious appreciation for pricing. I won't call it a passion because you think I'm crazy. I won't call it a religion because you think I'm too you know, fixed or, or stern about it. But a definite serious appreciation for, for pricing. Because pricing is a very critical piece of the business that's often overlooked, especially startups. Every startup pours oodles and oodles of resources and time and energy and dollars into cost engineering. They hire engineers and operations people and they try to pull every ounce of cost out of the product. But what they often forget is that the end game is about profitability. And a dollar of gross margin just as easily comes from a dollar of incremental price as it does from a dollar of reduced so when I think of pricing, I actually call it revenue engineering. And I think it's just as strategic and just as important a, an attribute of, a, of a, a startup in any business as cost engineering. And I think increasingly companies are starting to pay attention to that. And I've had lots of experiences doing it in the different spaces. I'm happy to you know, talk about them more as we go on or as we have questions. But a lot of lessons learned from that and a lot of appreciation for the different things that pricing can do for your business. Uh, from positioning, to buying you time when you need it, to knocking the competition out, to creating adoption or throttling adoption as the case may <coughs> be. I'm happy to talk about all those different types of products. Yeah, I was going to say, from my perspective, I think, um, I, I would go even further. I think pricing is more important often than cost engineering or um, what I typically see in, in a lot of companies, whether it's enterprise or, or consumer, is there's a, there's a huge focus on customer acquisition, but often that, that focus does not include anything to do with product pricing or product um, marketing. It, I guess I should say the marketing is kind of thought of as which channels am I going after, but less about the message and less about the price than it is about optimizing conversions. So you'll, you'll see people doing funnel, engine, you know, funnel optimization until the cows come home, but you won't see them change price. And you know, the simple explanation that I always tell people is a dollar price goes straight to your bottom line. A uh, conversion rate increase doesn't. It, it helps you a little bit, but it just drops you to the next step in the funnel, and then you get to work on that step in the funnel. And not that that's not really important, it is. But for, especially for a startup that's, that's not generally, generally generating a huge amount of revenue, incremental revenue coming from the top line straight to the bottom line is, is absolutely you know, huge. 
So I, it's, it's a really important focus for me. I spend quite a bit of time with the companies that I work with on it because I think it's, it's really, really underappreciated in, in startups especially. Maybe we should pause here for a second and see if there's any specific you know, questions that we've uh, stirred up based on the other uh, examples we've offered so far. Well, if I may, uh, it's a very interesting topic, but it uh, seems to me that uh, the world pricing you know, has many, many factors. You know, like you're the first one in the market with a specific product. You know, it seems to me like the field is open, and you can choose the pricing better. But if you're trying to get in, compete with a differentiator to existing products that already exist, you know, you're kind of bound by what the other companies are offering, right? So um, I don't know how you balance those two things. You know, it would be. Uh, because those two situations I've seen in my experience, you know, where you enter with uh, something brand new that nobody else has, in which uh, the job is to convince your customers that it's something of value, and you can set the price, you know, but I don't know how you would set it at the proper level. Well, so, so I think that's... Hey, can you, John, can you repeat the question if you could hear Yeah, I, I, with the question, if, I, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, and stop me if I'm not, was basically that if you're not the first market entrant, um, how do you set the pricing? Because the first market entry typically sets the pricing, and in your experience, you're saying that typically if you want to compete, you got to come in lower, right. and you know it's a race to race to, to zero. It's a difficult position to be second. Well, unless you have a huge differentiator, well, right? Right. Unless you have a huge differentiator, and that's where I was going with it. <coughs> it sucks to be in a company that doesn't have a differentiator. I try to avoid those kind of. <laughs> and, well, unless your differentiation is simply the fact that you're more efficient on cost and you can play the pricing game. But most startups and is, you know, most companies have a, a differentiation. And it's understanding that differentiation and understanding the value that helps you set the price. In some cases, you want to go after a different market segment than that first player. Right? So, you know, great case in point. You know, Blue Jeans, the company I'm at with right now, we built a, a, an interoperable a video collaboration service. Okay. What we're focused on initially is on people who have invested in video conferencing equipment, like the Cisco or Polycom conference rooms, to, and they want to get value out of those rooms by connecting them to more than just other Cisco and Polycom rooms. They want to connect them to all the, the desktop and mobile users on Skype and Google and Microsoft or just a browser and camera, and have this ease of use and reach and quality all in one. Now, when we entered the marketplace, um, we saw two distinct uh, competitors, if you will, or, or, or islands of, of, of technology. You saw the video conferencing players who were selling, you know, multi hundred thousand dollar solutions, and then we saw the, the WebExes and the, the, the meetings of the world who were trying to sell ten dollars a quarter. Right? What we had to figure out was where on that spectrum we wanted to play. And what I knew right away was I added value that these guys would appreciate. I didn't want to fight these guys in the slums. So how do I sell here? And then once I'm in here, cannibalize that amount of revenue by offering that kind of functionality, but doing it from this position. So a lot of it is using your pricing to, disseminate, to, to uh, discern what market segment you want to go after, and not following the you know, pricing down. In the old days, especially in hardware companies, it used to be a very simple model. It used to be very mechanical and sterile. Take your cost, multiply it times five, and that was your price, because you wanted to make sure that you had 65% margin at 30% discount. And that, that's a commodity play. Right? In today's world, the first thing you need to do when, you, when you're thinking about setting prices is understand what your goal is. If your goal isn't to play in a commodity space, it's to start out in a niche. And a lot of times you want to do that. Great case in point, when I was at, at Bloom Energy, we were looking at the marketplace. And we knew that there was a, a price that we could open up the entire market. It was just, it made it a no-brainer for everybody to say, I'm going to stop paying PG&E. And even if they shut my lights off, I'll have this box in the back that's going to generate electricity even cheaper. What we also realized was, as we were a young company, we had supply chain challenges. We couldn't build enough boxes. As long as I was supply constrained, it made no sense for me to price to open up the market. Because I would have created a, a, a supply challenge. So it made much more sense for me to keep my prices high, focus on finding the customers who could afford to play those prices, because I couldn't build enough to fulfill the market. So there's a lot of shades of gray here, and a lot of it is about understanding the market, understanding your supply situation, and understanding your value proposition doing a very thorough analysis of business. Okay. Yeah, I'll add just one more thing. I actually 
try not to differentiate so much between whether you're the first mover or you're the second mover, because at the end of the day, I think what you're trying to do is establish what's your value for the proposition to the customer. And whether there's other competitors in the market, there might be data points for somebody to look at, but you still have to establish your value proposition and the relative price that you want to, want to charge for that. I see a lot of people thinking, as in some cases, that they think they're going after a blue ocean, and so therefore, you know, maybe it's free or something, so that they get huge amounts of, of adoption. The free doesn't necessarily guarantee you huge amounts of adoption. People don't only think about price. So there's a huge signal in there, and you have to think about that as well. And you know, I think some people play the free game really, really well, but they, they also understand that going in. And they understand how they're going to monetize over time. So, it's a, it's a lot of, it's a very much a strategic decision regardless of when you're entering the market. The stakes, as an example, are more or less a commodity. You know, for me, you know, meat, it's cow. Um, but would you rather buy a five dollar steak or a thirty-five dollar steak? Well, I always love the. You, you've probably seen the studies that people they've actually done brain tests on uh, people who buy wine. And the higher price wine actually it changes the brain chemistry, and people think that it tastes better. <laughs> so it's, it's literally true that people think it tastes better. Okay. You just gave me a point there in the wine business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a question. Two questions. One on the free side, the first cost, long term benefit question. I know a company like this probably dealt with that, or even energy. So first cost versus long term benefit question, and how you you know how you price in those kind of situations, and then organizationally, what's the best sort of dynamic that you see in terms of who's involved in those pricing discussions? So the the, the question was, if, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, was about how do you deal with situations where there's a, a first cost that's high and a long term benefit, getting customers to see past that first cost for the, the long term benefit. Um, and the second question is about organizationally do you the right people to be involved in, in the pricing discussion? Yeah, yeah what's the you know, marketing, sales, uh, finance, etc. Yeah, um, so I, I think on, on the first part, that, that's always a challenge. Um, you know, a lot of times you have to get customers to look at a long term ROI. It's usually an easier type of sell to do when it's a more complicated consultative type, type selling product. Um, for instance, with Blue Jeans, which is you know a thousand dollars a month kind of a, a software as a service product, it's very hard for me to get customers to pay you know a hundred thousand dollars up front as opposed to pay, continuing to pay by the month because it's just not that kind of a product, and the transaction is much quicker. And, 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 and but with something like Blue Energy, right, where you know we're charging a million dollars for a box and they're going to keep that box for ten years, that was that kind of a value proposition. And what we would do is we actually built a very sophisticated financial model. And we would sit down with the CFOs and we would go through that model. And we knew every lever in that model and how it would impact the, the economics for the customer. And we knew from a lot of the homework that we were doing that there was a magic ROI for the customer. That if we could give them a three to five year payback on their capital investment, that every CFO we talked to would purchase. But we had to prove to them that they were going to get a three, year, three to five year payback this product that was in the last 10 years by a company that was only two years old, right? Um, and that was going to cost them a lot of capital up front, but they were going to save cents per kilowatt hour every minute that they used it. And that was a big challenge. But to do it, we had to really dive into the, the weeds. We built these tornado models where we know every lever. And we'd sit down with the customer and we'd say, what, is your, what are you paying for gas today? What are you paying for electricity today? What do you think you're going to be paying for those things over the next 10 years? And we would argue that they're going to escalate at 20% a year. They would argue 2%. We would negotiate with someone between, and we knew exactly where we wanted them to get. We would argue over things like, um, you know, carbon credits are going to have value. Let's build that into the model because that creates more value. And they'd say, no, 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 I'm not going to pay for carbon credits. And we'd say, great, well, then assign them to us. And they'd say, well, okay, well, maybe, maybe we will. <laughs> so you just learned all those levers and those tricks by getting out there and doing it and, and, and selling consultatively. And that's how you get over those kind of barriers, I think, with those companies. Yeah, I, I don't think I have much to add on that. That's absolutely those the you know, that's true enterprise sales. I think usually when we see that, and it, it's it's very much that consultative personal one-on-one -on -one kind of sales process. I think your, the second part of your question was in terms of organizations. Um, in startups, it's usually all hands on deck. From where at least where I invest, I invest really early, usually seed in the Series A stage. Um, but I would say I've also worked with some fairly large organizations on this. 
you know, everyone realistically should have some input on it, but I think the decision makers at the end of the day have to be the people that are touching the customers. So it's, to me, it, it ends up, the best is a combination of product, sales, and marketing all working together. Um, and, you know, as far as who in the organization makes the final call, I don't know, I think it's often, it's often left to marketing or in some cases the product, the product team, depending on how you structure it. Um, I don't have a strong feeling about who's the best kind of final say, but the people that are involved in, the, in attributing value to the product have to be involved in those discussions. I actually have a slightly different view on it. I think it, it typically belongs and resides with product management, wherever that is in the organization. The people who are fundamentally responsible for making sure you're building something that you sell, and you're selling what you built, and that have that conduit and that knowledge of what the costs are, what the market will bear, and whatnot. I think the worst place pricing can reside is with sales. Um, I think you actually want to have a healthy separation of church and state between pricing and sales. Um, you know, because you want that, that healthy conflict. You want the person who has to make the quota responsible for setting the price because there's a built-in conflict of interest. And you know, I love salespeople by the way, so, so don't don't take that the wrong way. But you know, I, I, there's a Henry Ford quote that I'm, I, I just you know, very fond of the quote there's something like if I had asked my customers what they wanted, I would have built faster horses. Right? And that's kind of you know why I think it doesn't it shouldn't reside with sales. Sales is going to be looking at what the customers say, and it's sometimes harder for them to look at the, the, what they're saying behind what they're saying. And I think pricing is a lot of that. Uh, you know, a, 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 a case in point, uh, when we started Blue Jeans, what we heard from customers loud and clear was that they liked minutes plans, that they wanted to buy, you know, buy, buy by the minute because it tended to be the cheapest way you could buy a service from. And we listened to them initially, and that was one of the plans that we offered. And it was one of the most popular plans that we <coughs> bought, but it was one of the worst plans for adoption and churn and things like that. Because customers would buy it because it was cheap, they would worry about their money, so they wouldn't, wouldn't use it as aggressively, and they wouldn't ever get as committed to the program. It was, it, was, it was too low a bar for them to try the service. It was really just an extended trial. Um, what we found is if we started to eliminate those plans or push the price points of those plans up, we could steer people more to unlimited type plans. And unlimited plans, though they were a little bit more expensive to get in, which maybe goes a little bit more to your first point, were better for us and better for them. Because they didn't worry about adoption, they used the service at about 10x the rate of people who are on minutes plans, and they found more value in the service, and we saw a virality from there. So again, you know, you have to listen to your customers, but you also have to hear and see past what they're saying. A quick follow-up question on that. Do you find that Customers still want to start with the, the minutes plan, or you have more and more customers actually starting with the formula for the minutes It varies. What we've started to do is we started to realize that there's a threshold. There's a threshold of customer that we want. Right? So we're not, you know, we don't price to be the cheapest customer out there to get everybody in the world to try it. Because there are customers we don't like. Right? They're not serious, they're going to drain a lot more from us than they're going to create value. So we don't want to have plans that entice those customers come to us if we're going to spend more on them than we're going to, we're going to get back in return. So yes, we still have minutes plans. Again, we've gotten rid of some of the lower plans, so we've scared people up. There are still people who like to buy the minutes plans, but it's, it's become you know, what was maybe 50% of our mix a uh, year and a half ago, and now it's maybe 10% of our mix on our sales. Yep. So I, this is just a, my question. Is there
So the metrics I typically look at, I try to keep it really simple, but conversion rates are huge. Uh, churn rates are very, very significant. And then I try to look beneath that at the customer behaviors and the types of customers. So you look at the segmentation of, of your mix that's come in. Are these customers that you want? Are these high value customers? Are they opting for different plans based on, on you know, different key metrics that are key kind of indicators that you would have about that customer? Yeah, I think John pretty much nailed it from a, you know, certainly for a software as a service perspective, you look at those kind of metrics and you continually tune in. You're never done pricing. You're always going to tune, whether it's you're trying to optimize you know, your market or the competitive landscape changes or the product evolves or you add new features, you're always, you're always evolving. In different markets, it, it is going to be different. You know, in the, in, a, in a, a hardware cell you know, type of market, you're, you're looking at different things, more of, of repeat purchases, um, things like that. You're looking at are your gross margins, you know, where you want them to be, those kinds of things. Um, again, another reason why I, I love sales, but I don't always listen to sales, is sales are always going to tell you your prices are too high. It's always easier to sell something you know, at a lower price than what you're asking for. But um, I encourage you to generally resist that for a while. Yeah. Should, should yeah. The other thing I try to do with salespeople when I'm, when I'm involved in the, in the structure is to incent them based on revenue per customer as opposed to just kind of quotas or even just pure revenue quotas because there's ways that they can manipulate that. But if you end up trying to incent them the same way that you would want the product team to be incented, I think you tend to get a little bit better data from your sales team. Um, you, have, you have to be, you know, kind of a little bit flexible in some cases with those, but the compensation structure for salespeople has a lot to do with how well they perform and even with some of the data you get back. I also think as a rule of thumb, you always want to start with your pricing higher. Because it's always easier to lower your price than it is to raise it, although it's not impossible to raise it, and I've done that in the past, and I can talk a little bit more about that later. But it's always easier to lower. And what you, all, what you generally want to do out of the gate is you want to establish a value for something. And when you set a high price, you establish the value. You can always discount it or you can reduce prices later, but you want to establish the value because A, you're creating a position in the market, and B, that actually helps sell to people. When they say that this has this kind of value, but I'll sell it to you for this. So it's generally, as a rule of thumb, start higher, push back on some of the initial, you know, it's too high price, but also realize when you push long enough and, and it is inhibiting your sales and be flexible on how you adjust it. Can you talk a little bit about the international differences that you've seen? Um, especially, John, you mentioned that you sit on a board in India. So in particular, in India, and how they haggle, and how you actually get the sale across the finish line. Yeah, I think it, it is, there's, there's a huge cultural aspect. Oh, yeah. The question was um, differences in pricing across different geographies and different countries. Um, I see it fairly dramatically in, in I can comment that the Indian company actually is going after multiple different markets, so it's a little bit harder. But what I see in India is just the, the haggling does it does have a huge impact. And in some cases, the low price is a big deal. It's actually, it really does help to drive adoption there. Um, but I think we've stuck to trying to keep a value proposition. <clears throat> One of the things we've done with that particular company that's in the travel space is offer multiple different plans to try to cater to different segments of the population and then track each each customer really carefully to see how that's segmenting out and then we adjust the pricing that way. I was gonna say though that there's there's huge cultural differences in some areas, especially in consumer behaviors uh, across countries. So what I've, I have sit on two boards in Germany that are doing e-commerce globally and for example, return rates in Germany are three times higher than they are in the UK. Um, because culturally, Germans are more than happy to send something back anytime if they don't think it's that good. Um, so you have to really, then part of your value proposition and your messaging is about the quality of the product and standing behind it. But, and so the pricing in Germany is actually higher as well. So we, we accomplished a couple of things by that. We anchor people very high, which as Stu said, I, I speak about anchoring all the time. You want somebody to think immediately when they look at your product that it's a high quality product, <coughs> generally speaking. Um, if, if, if there's a choice, I guess that's, where, that's usually where you want to be. But um, in some cases, you want to, you maybe want a 
uh, to be a commodity product and would be different, but generally I would say you're, you're trying to anchor somebody high. Um, so in Europe, for example, Spain is dramatically different than, uh, than Germany, uh, which is different than the UK, which is different than France. Um, so in a lot of cases, our top line is a little bit different, or we'll even we'll offer slightly different packages or different options within those different geographies. Do you see that in the enterprise space as well? Uh, enterprise a little less, a little less in the enterprise space. Consumer is definitely a, a, a much a much harder proposition when you're going across culture. Enterprise, I think, to a certain extent, you're, you're it's a similar process. You're trying to anchor people on the value proposition. And you know, to me, enterprise pricing is much more about finding out what's valuable to the customer than it is about going in with a rate sheet. And that's true across cultures. I think the other thing about enterprise is two maybe fairly modern dynamics. One is live enterprises are multinational. So you know, if you're trying to sell to them in Germany and the US at the same time, they're sharing pricing. The other thing is the internet and you know, uh, discussion forms. Pricing gets out a lot faster than it ever did in the past. So it's a lot harder to maintain differentiated pricing, especially in the enterprise, without differentiated product or differentiated value in those different geographies. I can't comment on one, though, that's interesting in the, in the enterprise space. There are some variations in there from, from time to time. Um, I work with a company called Food Suite that some people might be familiar with. Um, I've done quite a bit of pricing optimization with them, both on the SaaS model piece, and then they also have a large enterprise sales. Uh, we got strong feedback from some customers in Japan that they passed on us because the pricing was too low. And so the pricing in Japan for Hootsuite is fairly different than it is here in the US, and they really value high quality product, and if you sell something that's cheap, they think it's bad. And it's, it's across the board. It's really, and it's true even at the low end. So our pricing models there are different, and they don't really care that the, the comp in the US is different. They care very much about the, the quality of the product, and it's exactly the same product. We raise the price, and, and I can tell you, we, without giving any specifics, I've done, I did multiple different pricing um, optimizations with them. In the SaaS model, where we have uh, a freemium, so Hootsuite, just so everybody knows, is a social media management platform. They sell, it's a freemium product, so you can use it for free. And then they upsell to small businesses at, I think it's $9.99 and $19.99 and $29.99, sort of like LinkedIn in terms of the low end pricing. And then the enterprise pricing is on a per seat basis and, and goes to hundreds of thousands per, per year. So very different products at the end of the day, although there's a spectrum that goes across. And they have, In, in, what, in what we did. So we created different bundles 
of features and offer different pricing and did that in such a way we were doing some conjoint analysis on the back end for all the important people who, uh, who come up. I will tell you in the industry, almost no one knows what that is. <laughs> so coming out of Wharton, you actually have an advantage and there's some tools that you have that are really, really useful that, that not everybody's doing. I can't even make that part. <laughs> I'm actually embarrassed to admit I don't know. <laughs> uh, so we were trying to establish which features were really valued by customers without asking them for, through salespeople, but by behaviors. And that led us to be able to say, okay, these features are really what's driving some of the key pricing on it, and then we were able to create bundles that make sense. Are you familiar with and experience with the razor razor blade model, and particularly what do you price the razor at? Because I've heard both ends if you want to keep it low because you're going to make your money over the razor blades or the long term, versus you want to price your razor high because then the person feels like. You know, I've got all this sunk cost and I want to, you know, I want to switch to a, a new type of, you know, a new razor. So I'm going to keep buying those razor blades year after year after year and then you can incrementally increase your prices. Have you had experience with that sort of model and concerns about? I, I think, you know, like a lot of the answers on pricing, it depends. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's going to be more market dependent. I think there's there's markets where, you know, again, like, like, the, like the, the cell phone market where you have to give away the phones because it's, it's very sticky, there's a long lifetime. Once they're hooked, they're not going anywhere, likely, and you can make it all come back in. Uh, where it's a little bit less sticky, you probably want to create a little more anchor with the, the value of the, of the you know, first purchase. Uh, but I think it's going to vary. I was going to say, I haven't made any investments, but I'm pretty familiar with, I'm sure everybody has probably heard of Dollar Shave Club down in LA, and then Harry's out in New York. And in Germany, there's a competitor called Morning Glory. Um, and it has a lot to do with how you want your brand to, per to be perceived. Typically though, you don't want to overprice your razor in the first place so that you get large adoption. So you're often trying to, to maximize that conversion, but then you watch the churn rates on the razor blade. So, you know, Harry's tried to go out and say that they're a, a more premium product, so they priced more premium than, than Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club obviously came out with, with a low value proposition as part of their name and the, in the first place. The guys in Germany are doing the same as Harry's. They're trying to, to do a quality. Often what they're trying to do though is quality at about the same price as Gillette or a little bit lower than Gillette and, and the convenience. So again, it all depends on what people are valuing. If it's the convenience, if it's the quality, if it's both. Um, but those models to me often are, are based more around convenience than they are around the product per se as long as the product is Um, I would love to hear your comments and thoughts on the Netflix pricing fiasco in 2011. If if you know much about the details of it, if you think that what I'm most curious about is, do you think that I think most people thought that they were stupid for raising the price by like 60% on their combined DVD and streaming? Were they actually did they know they would take a hit on the users on that and expect people to move to streaming? Or I don't know if you know much about it. I I, I don't. Um, you know I, I think that. Um I would hope to give them the benefit of the doubt that it's part of a broader strategy and that they, they knew that they were going to create some short term pain for some long term gain. And it seems like they've rebounded well from it. Um, but I, I don't know. Other than to say Netflix is a customer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I can't comment too much either, but I, it's a smart team over there, so I, I can't believe that, that it was just completely botched in terms of what they really wanted to get long term. And I think that was the transition over to streaming. And so. It's hard to say for sure. Um, back to the SaaS pricing. Um, are there any general learnings on premium model versus free trial? Yeah, I mean, at, at Blue Jeans, we're, as, as I said, a SaaS company, and we're not a freemium company. We made a conscious decision not to do that. I was saying at Blue Jeans we're a SaaS company, but we're not a premium company. We made a conscious decision to go down that path because we felt we had value. We had value that solved a problem that we thought business customers, which is our target market, would pay for. It may have been different if we're going into the, the consumer space. Um, you know, I'm old fashioned, maybe, and then I think a path to profitability is much better than an eyeball you know, path to maybe an MA. Um, and I think that the free trial is a version of freemium that you know, is, 
is is a good path and have a, a real value proposition. And it's not just about you know, volume; it's about solving pain points that people will help them. I was going to say, in my experience, I actually find if you're trying to sell to whether whether it's any kind of a business customer, SMBs all the way up to, to large enterprises, I would say usually the freemium is not necessarily where you want to go. Because the freemium stats are pretty well known. You're, you're probably going to get a maximum of 3 to 5% conversion to paid, and that paid is, is going to be anchored based on the differentiation between the, you know, the, the premium product and the non-premium product. So when you look at the success stories of the freemium, it's you know, people like LinkedIn, who established value and got broad adoption. So typically the only way I see premium working is if you get some substantial adoption across large numbers. You know, Hootsuite is in the, the large millions of, of users, and so then converting some of them into paid is not so hard. But usually I think when you're trying to sell to any kind of a business customer, the free trial is going to be a, a better option. Um, Follow-up question, more specific. In Salesforce world, in the app exchange world, you've got this anchor of the enterprise pricing, 120 bucks, you know, use it per month, whatever. And then you got all these other guys that are plugging in that all think that they actually add more value than their core, but they kind of have this ecosystem ceiling. You know, how do you think about pricing in that situation? Um, I, I, I think again, it's it's going to be product dependent and what you're trying to do with it. Salesforce and the app exchange is your channel, or if it's an incremental channel. If it is your channel, I would tend to still err on the side of, of, of trial and price base as opposed to premium. If you're using it to augment your channel and get you into a, you know, a new market, then I could see you know, more of a premium model being you know, have to go down there. But then you have to be careful about cannibalization versus your core product. So I don't know that I can give a definitive recommendation about better understanding. I, I do think in that in that scenario, if you're if you are in you know, Salesforce App Exchange is your your only market, you probably have set yourself up to look more like a feature or like an add-on than as a standalone product. And so I think part of the thought process has to be: is there more beyond that that then that you can get over that ceiling? Have you ever been in successful pricing SaaS for a reseller or? Uh, Referral channel, and if so, what were some of the lessons learned? Can you repeat the question? The question was about success pricing SaaS uh, services <coughs> uh, through a reseller channel. Yeah. And uh, at least I can speak from my experiences. Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, Blue Jeans, we have about 70 uh, channel partners of different types of channels, um, and we've been very successful. Um, we typically have a revenue share model. It depends on the partner's level of commitment, how much of a revenue share they get. And the way we've attacked it um, is that we view the channel, at least at this stage, this will change over time. It's very strategic to us, but initially, and I don't mean this in the negative way it's going to sound, but initially incompetent. Meaning they're great early on in bringing new leads because they know how to smell something that's generally good for your service. They are happy to take the deal on their paper, but in between they're lost. Yeah. And so we have at our company a, a compensation neutral model which has our direct team actually focused on closing deals with the channel. And in this first you know, year or two of that process, it helps the channel, you know, the old learn to fish analogy, if you will, and makes for a successful business model. Because with the channel, what you typically want to do is get a couple people successful, and then it kind of bleeds out from there. And the reason you pick the channel is you <coughs> can hire the sales people one, two, five at a time. They've got you know, hundreds of thousands of people. So having a model that's attractive enough for them Finding channels that can live off of the SaaS model. One of the less, other lessons we learned that were more negative was trying to get hardware resellers. And you know, we saw, thought there were people that sell these video conferencing endpoints, boxes. Let's let them add blue jeans to the service on top of it, create more value for those boxes. And about half of them succeeded with that, and half of them failed. The ones that succeeded with that were the ones who weren't selling. They were just selling endpoints, but not infrastructure along with those endpoints. The ones who failed were the ones who were also selling infrastructure boxes, and they couldn't get off of the cocaine of the big upfront hardware sale, and they're dying a slow death. Right? But understanding the partner's mentality and can they take on the software as a service model and the type of annuity, lower but annuity revenue stream as opposed to the upfront dollars which have to go to 
compensate their salespeople, and then help them fish, I think, the two lessons that we Did you have to help them learn how to do billing, or did you do billing for them? Um, no, I mean, we, we, we had to provide integration between our billing tool and their billing tools. Okay. Um, but generally, billing wasn't. Uh, what are some of the common pricing mistakes you see? Or the, the ones that people make again and again and you wish they'd get the lesson? For me, it's very simple. Everybody prices too low. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, just, that, it's just that simple. I, I can't tell you how many board meetings I sit in where the first, the first thing they say is, well, hey, we think we're going to price competitor A is priced at this, you know, at $19.99, competitor B is at $17.99, and competitor C is at $16.99, so therefore, $14.99 is obviously the logical price for us to price our, our and, and you want to just, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, go ahead. I, I, I totally echo that. I think you have to, you have to appreciate the value of your product. You have to make sure that the sales force is trained to appreciate the value of your product mm -hmm. and not cave. Because customers, especially once you get past the champion and you get to the purchasing agent, they are trained and compensated to ask for discounts. And salespeople often will just feel like they have to do it. So don't apologize for the value of your product. We'll, what, we'll, you know, what we'll see at our company is we'll have two different salespeople, maybe with, with almost identical territories, and they'll have totally different have average you know, sales prices for the product. Why is that? It's not because the product's different, it's not because their customer base is different, it's because they're different. And one guy is less able or less willing to stick, sell value and stick to the price points. The other guy feels like you know he's just got to close the deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the other thing I was going to add is beyond the the low price, I find that a lot of companies don't spend enough time trying to to articulate the key value proposition that they have, and it, it's often very much tied into to the pricing as opposed to thinking, okay, we're similar to these guys, you have to figure out where you want to play and what are the key things that, that make you valuable. And I don't think enough people spend time on that. I see, especially with startups, you see people spending you know, hours, days, months, weeks, years on product. Okay, we're going to add this feature and we're going to add this feature and our roadmap has all these different things. But I don't see them strategically thinking about, you know, this is what is a core value of our product that's going to make it more valuable and is going to raise the price. And they don't necessarily prioritize those. It's often the squeaky wheel or whatever, you know, the top customers have asked for. And not necessarily as strategic on even the product side. But that articulation of value is something that I don't find that people spend enough time on or are as good at as I would like to see. I think one last thing that I'll add is that I think a lot of people don't really understand what they're pricing for. Right? They have the knee-jerk reaction, like what you said, I got to be underneath, I got a price for adoption right off the bat. Mm -hmm. right? And that's not always the best decision. I gave the example before about when you're supply limited, why would you price to the mass market? But things like that, I think people don't think through, and they just, you know, they just follow the herd. And that's a bad thing to get. Yeah, you um, were saying that uh, you have to value your product, but you, uh, when you are in a company that you have form and, and, and you are in love with the product, and, and it's very difficult to say, no, I don't have a good product, but maybe you are the only one that is saying, yes, I have a good product. How can you not make the mistake that you have valued your product and you really valued your product? But your pricing strategy going to the higher uh, price is not working. It's a fair point that that happens. I think if the question was, as, as, the, as a member of the company, you value your product and you think it's great and it's worth this high price point. But if you hear time and time again that the customer is not willing to pay that, do you have a problem? And the answer is yes. If, that, if that's your situation, you have a problem. And you have one of two problems. Either you're priced too high, in which case adjust and, and learn and adapt. Um, or you've got a bigger problem, which is you don't have the value proposition that will, will fund your business. Right. In which case, get out <laughs> right. and go do the next thing. But what about you know when it's emotional? Because a lot of your stuff you know is software as a service, but I come from the apparel industry, so I can have a bag that's just as good as a Louis Vuitton bag, if not better, and I'm 
pricing it the same, but I don't have that emotional status symbol. So I mean, I don't know if you have any experience on getting like a lot from all. Is it just like a lot of marketing money? Or? That's a great question. The question is about the emotional value. Um, and I think, again, my, my Bloom Energy experience is a, is a great value there, is that we figured out early on that back in 2006 and 7, 8, when we were first bringing this product to market, that the customer who was buying this product wasn't just buying it for the savings on their cost of electricity or even for the carbon savings. They were buying it because they wanted to brand themselves green, right, and, and avant-garde and good, you know, and planet conscious and all those things. And we realized that. So when we built this product, um, and I don't know if you've ever seen a bloom box, but you know, it, it's essentially, a, you know, I remember when we, when we were getting ready to do the, uh, the 60 Minutes interview for the launch, and the producer came in and he's, you know, after, after we had pitched him the story, and he said, I got good news and bad news. The good news is everybody's gonna love this story. We, we, we really wanna do it. The bad news is your box is a refrigerator, and this is TV. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't do anything. But if you think about it, you know, the bloom box could have been this just shipping container looking thing that just is, is dull and, and brown and, and has smokestacks coming out of it and look like crap. But we said we don't want to do that. We said we're going to make it look more Apple than Caterpillar. Right? So we hired IDEO to come in and design this thing with nice glowy lights and a, a slick you know, a, a stainless steel kind of exterior. And that had tremendous value. Right? It didn't necessarily add to the price, but it helped us sell it at the price. Because we were selling to companies that wanted to put it out front and display this thing as a, as a, a prominent you know, figure of, the, of their, their commitment to everything good in the world and not buried out back by the dumpster. So there is value in the emotion. It's not always enough, but if it's there, it's certainly worth tapping into. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I work with a couple of commerce companies and specifically on, on that value proposition. And in Germany, there's there's one that's the, that I sit on the board of where we do, it's called a company called Urban Mara that does home furnishings and pretty high end. They source from all over the world. So anything from cashmere from you know this place to high end leather products from different places. And we sell them. And part of I think the, what you need to do in that scenario is not simple because you have to build a brand. Uh, you just can't price at the premium level coming out of the gate in almost any case where it's a consumer or a, or a kind of a, an emotional purchase. There is a company in Germany that I we've not invested in that I've spent some time with that's selling handbags, custom, custom made handbags that you can actually help design on the website. And they chose, I think, fairly effectively to price above what a lower end bag would be, but not nearly what the top end bags would be. And they're doing quite well. And the plan is, as they get some adoption and they start to build a brand, they'll introduce new lines at higher price points and start to move up that way. So I do think you can do that in some scenarios where you create almost new product categories or you have different levels. It's, it's actually one of the other, you know, there's a very simple rule in pricing that people will always choose the middle one if, if there's nothing else, you know, in, in almost every scenario. And this is an example, too, in whether it's SaaS model software um, that you're selling kind of publicly or it's uh, or it's consumer having three price points is actually really really effective and even if you never ever sell the top price point throw a high price point out there have one bag that you've made that you're selling for ridiculous amounts and anchor people's thoughts and wow they make some really high quality products and then the next one seems a little bit less you know less intimidating and it, and it works it's, it absolutely works So um, you touched on this a little bit, but for the company that may be priced for you know adoption early on, but then eventually decides money's being left on the table or they, they feel the market can support a price increase, just any thoughts or general strategies around how that rolls out? You know, as, as you mentioned, it induces a fair amount of anxiety for, for sales. Um, just get, get to get your, your general thoughts. Yeah, I mean, you, you gotta have value to be able to raise prices, otherwise you create a lot of hostility. And that hostility will pass. Because you know, people will forget the old pricing and, and you can survive bad press. Uh, I always joke that bad press is good, good press is better as long as the top is not good. But it is a lot about value. One of the things I'm proudest at during you know, my time at Bloom Energy was we raised our prices over a, a two year period by about 40 to 50 percent. And we did it without ever changing the customer's bottom line. In other words, um, 
customer was paying, you know, let's say X dollars per kilowatt, right? And what we figured out was that by changing some of those, those elements of the model, like I talked about adding the carbon credit value, or by um, getting government incentives into the mix, right? We could, or by doing this version of depreciation versus this version of depreciation, we could actually charge a higher price but have the customer's net price be the same amount. And so we did that religiously because that was free money. Because the customer had no, you know, no resistance to paying that, and it was all adding, you know, to to our top line. So you know, again, it's understanding that that value, and it's looking for the levers you have to justify the pricing. And again, if you can make it transparent to the customer, that's even better. I, I look at it in a couple of different ways. I I like to talk a lot about raising switching costs. So if you especially in SaaS model software, if you can continually <coughs> provide enough value that your customers are less and less likely to move to any other product, you have a, a great position then to be able to raise pricing. And my simple advice to people is usually, if you're gonna increment price, do it on a, whether it's a, a you know, calendar basis or it's a uh, feature basis, so you release a, a major iteration of the product and with that comes a price increase. So that there's sort of a natural thought process to it and not just a, hey, guess what, we doubled prices, yes. You know, it's, you have to do that in a logical way so that you don't piss off your whole customer base. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about providing that value so that, so that somebody doesn't feel bad about taking that price increase. Okay. Doug? So just um, I wonder if there's a case study that comes to mind in the consumer space and in the enterprise space for a company that has done a great job pricing that was apparent or a complete failure in pricing. Just kind of an example of uh, things that you guys have succeeded. Uh, again, I'm, I'm kind of partial to my own experience with, with Bloom and the way we were able to do pricing. We, we've already talked about that. I mean, sometimes failures are, are more instructive than successes. I mean, have you seen companies that have gone out and just completely stepped on the rate because they completely screwed up the pricing structure? Yes, but I'm, I'm not blank right now. <laughs> I was going to say on the on the enterprise side, one of the one of the one of the companies that I most respect on that is, is LinkedIn. I think they've done an excellent job of, of figuring out tiers of pricing. And I love people have actually experimented very much with LinkedIn, but if you step up to one tier, the next time you go to that page to look into the options, there's three new ones and they're all higher than what you're at. So they're, they're very smart about not necessarily letting you anchor very clearly and always putting your thought process a little bit higher up. And then on the other side, when they're selling to recruiters and, and um, you know, to, the, to that part of the industry, which is the key part of the revenue, they've done an excellent job of establishing how much value they bring to the table, and they're really extracting you know, good value out of those customers. I think um, this might not be a great, perfect example, but I, I actually think Starbucks has done a good job with the price. The fact that they get you to pay $4 for a quarter uh, and smile while you're doing it, and pay even more if they're going to throw a little bit of milk in there. And, Again, it speaks to creating value beyond the So as an early stage startup in enterprise space, uh, how do you do price testing because cost of customer acquisition is so high, so you don't want to you know, go to one customer, spend some time with them, acquire them, and then say like, hey, I want to test these prices. How do you go about it? What are some techniques you can employ? I think the, what I've always done is pricing doesn't start when you hire your first salesperson. Pricing starts way before that. It's when you're doing your initial customer discovery and putting your product thesis together. It's when you're you know, getting ready to enter beta or, or, or trial. Um, and that's the best time to do it as well because when you could go to a customer and say, this is not a sales call. This is a customer discovery call. No pressure, I'm not gonna try to sell anything. You could tell me I suck and I'll walk away and I'll be happy. You get a lot more information out of them. You get a lot more real information out of them because they're not trying to gain you because there, there is an interest there. Um, so my, my, my advice is start the, the, the pricing analysis early, get the customer feedback, but as I said earlier, look past what you hear, what they're really saying, what's the motivation for what you're hearing, and then it's, it's test, it's iterate, it's try different things um, as you get closer and closer to the actual date and you start selling the product. Yeah. Um, so a similar question involving enterprise space, but um, how do you 
do you think about setting an initial price when you're starting with a blank slate? So starting from a, a position where you have been giving your product away for free and you build it out and test it, and now you're at a point where uh, <coughs> you think it's pretty awesome your clients are starting to see value out of it and there is a willingness to pay for it. I, I, I couldn't hear quite question. all of it. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, setting an initial price um, starting with a big blank slate where you've been giving away your product for free. We actually went through that at Hootsuite because the first two years we just gave the product away for free. Um, and my belief was that the initial initial price was too low. And I think we were, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that works, right? Yeah, it's shocking that I would say that. Uh, as it turned out, when we had more experimentation, that, that wasn't the case. It's, it's pretty, it's always funny to me when you, when you you know, you see these light bulbs go off and somebody, when they, when they look and they say, wow, we raised the price and our conversion rates actually went up. And, and it's just shocking to them on, on multiple levels because all of a sudden their funnel looks better and their revenue looks dramatically better. So um, it's, it's, always, it's fun to see that. That's not always the case, but I usually tell, tell people when, you, when you're looking at this, the, the elasticity of pricing at the low end is usually not very high. In other words, the difference between $9.99 and $14.99 is almost immaterial for, for most people. Not, and that's not always the case, and it depends a little bit on product, but as a, as a general rule of thumb, there's not a dramatic, if you're gonna get somebody to cross the hurdle of actually paying, the fact that they'll pay you know, $9.99 versus $13.99 in, in a premium model, you, you're only talking about 5% of the population anyway, so you should be extracting some value from those customers. You know, in terms of when to do it, I think you need to have a, a large enough customer base that you're, that, you know, when you think about 5% of it, what does that look like? And then I think you also have to establish value in terms of the customer behavior on the product. So if, the, if your customer is in there using it every single day and they're spending hours on the product. So Hootsuite, we were seeing social media managers spending eight to 10 hours a day every single day in the product. Very clear that we had a, a constituency that was more than happy to use it on a consistent basis and would probably pay for it. So you have a few conversations with them and then you can, you know, that will help you to establish that price. And then you just articulate what the differentiator is between the premium and the, and the free. And, you, and it, it's a continually iterating process though. It's not sort of like you throw, you throw out a price and you throw out a premium product and all of a sudden you're done. That just continues to iterate pretty much for the rest of your company's life. I think another way to at least think about is it a benchmark that's a milestone that, that says you're ready for that, is if you believe that if you were to just, not charge them, but just cut off your customer tomorrow and say, you know, can't use the service anymore, would they miss it? Would they be mad at you for cutting, cutting them off? If they don't care enough, then you're not at the point where, it's, as John said, you've got the, the stickiness, the adoption, the virality, those kind of things. So if you don't think that they would care if you cut them off, then you're not ready to start pressing. If you think they would, then you've established value. And then it's just a matter of how much notification you give them, what price points you do, and those kinds of things. I believe, actually, on, I think it's on Quora, but I'm not 100% positive. For those of you who know Kiss Metrics, the CEO, Kitten Shaw, has done a little bit of writing on this topic. Um, he, he wrote something up, and I think it was an answer to a question on Quora about this in terms of what are some of the key metrics for SaaS model software? One of the ones that always resonated with me was when you get as many when you get more customers coming in organically than you get through sales or through paid channels, then you know you have a good SaaS product and you know that you're ready to probably be getting premium pricing. In startups, time is money, and I just wondered about pricing and cash flow. I mean, or do you? Do you Build that in your considerations, uh, or is that just a nuance, you know, secondary to getting new market acceptance? Yeah. Are there are there tools or tricks that you use in pricing to, to keep the cash coming in as fast as possible? Uh, yeah. So the question was about pricing and, and how you can use pricing to influence cash flow. Um, and the answer is yes. I mean, a, a common common practice is creating discounts or the inverse of those for prepaying versus you know, paying monthly for the service. We've gotten to the point with, uh, with BlueJean service that about 70% of our customers now prepay. 
and you know, average contract length is just about a year, and that's really valuable to to, to a startup. That, that you know, that cash, even though it's not revenue, yeah. that cash really helps fund the growth that you're really trying to, to get. So uh, it's definitely a good tactic to encourage prepays, encourage longer contracts as well, as opposed to month to month uh, type things. Um, early on in our service, we offered pay per use. We got rid of that. You know, about a year and a half ago, it just wasn't worth it. Well, if no other questions, why don't we go ahead and, and wrap up. I'd like to say thank you so much to both John and Ben and Stu for um, coming this morning, especially in the circumstances like this, where you caught us by surprise. We all showed up here at 6.30 and no electricity and no power, and we kind of improvised, but fortunately it turned out okay. So thank you so much. Please join me in thank you.